my friends and neighbors, brothers and sisters all, the most important question in human history is one which will not go away. It echoes down through the corridors of time. And Jesus asked them, what think ye of Christ? Sooner or later, this is the vital question for all mortals, including you, my friends. And a failure to answer this question is an answer. Granted, there have been and still are so many mortals on this planet who do not even yet know the name of Jesus Christ, let alone accept him as their redeemer. Many others are too preoccupied with the cares of the world. Still others acknowledge Jesus as a great moral teacher, as if he were merely a one-time Socrates of Samaria or a Plato who lived in Palestine. Ancient prophets not only foresaw the coming of Jesus in his mortal ministry, but also the reaction to Jesus. And alas, most would merely consider him a man. The Apostle John highlighted the differing opinions in that time concerning Jesus. Many of the people said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. And every man went unto his own house. Yet these holy scriptures tell us again and again that he who was known as Jesus of Nazareth is so much more than a man, even a man of genuine historical significance. In fact, Jesus is our resurrected Redeemer, our Lord and Savior. Therefore, what one thinks of Christ represents a determination of deep significance, which will affect not only this life, but eternity as well. Human history, in fact, has no ultimate meaning without Christ. Christ is the verification of God's purposes for mankind, of the meaning of this life, and the assurance of life to come. To accept him is an act drenched in meaning and significance. To testify of him is to testify to the reality of all that matters. One day, in a moment of unparalleled drama, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. Even so, meanwhile, as foreseen, too many mortals, including those today, judge Jesus to be a thing of naught. Yet the Holy Scriptures testify abundantly and repeatedly of him. Hence, true Christians unhesitatingly and unashamedly talk of Christ. We rejoice in Christ. We preach of Christ. We prophesy of Christ. During his mortal ministry, Jesus organized a church with formal authority. This cannot be doubted. As Paul wrote, that church was built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. The valiant struggle of Jesus' followers to implement his teachings fills the pages of the New Testament. Now it is for those of us who live today to give our answer to the key question. What do we think of Christ? However, we must first ascertain who Jesus is. It was Jesus Christ, under the direction of the Father, who created this earth. The Apostle John referred to Jesus, saying, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Why all this creating? Because the decreed and redemptive purpose of God the Father is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. This was the very purpose for this planet about which Isaiah spoke. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it, not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. This inhabited earth has thus become mankind's mortal schoolhouse. We rightly marvel and even worry over the earth's delicate ecological balances, the manner in which this planet is so tilted and orbited that it is inhabitable. 
with soil, seasons, and moisture. Moreover, Jesus, who formed this planet under the direction of the Father, likewise took as much care in planning the curriculum of this life's learning experience as in planning the schoolhouse itself. Thus, this act of creation was an act of divine love, fulfilling God's purpose to provide for all of us the needed experience of mortality, to be followed by a judgment according to our individual works and by the glorious resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and the extension of that resurrection to all mankind are proof of his divinity and love. We need not doubt the reality of the resurrection simply because we do not understand it. We witness the constant miracle of birth. It is real, although not fully understood. The coming of a newborn child occurs under the direction of a loving Father in heaven. So will the resurrection of everyone who has ever lived, who now lives, or who will yet live upon this planet. As mankind's physical horizons have broadened, unfortunately, our spiritual horizons have remained shrunken. This is so because so many are uncertain or indifferent concerning Christ. Mercifully, in achieving the atonement, Jesus Christ was not indifferent to us. He took upon himself our sins. He redeemed and purchased us with his blood. He ransomed us from both physical and spiritual death. He became, as Paul wrote, our mediator with God the Father. My friends, Jesus is our Savior. This blessed fact will not go away, and it should stir within us undying gratitude and cause us to place Christ at the very center of our lives by accepting him and the terms he has laid down as our Redeemer. We begin to appreciate the atonement with more than passive intellectual acknowledgement only when, in the words of one prophet, we accept the terms of his atonement and apply the atoning blood of Christ. We do this by repenting of our sins and by then having them washed away by the holy ordinance of baptism, an act of both cleansing and commitment, and by receiving the confirming witness of the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Without this conversion and rebirth, and without its resulting childlike spiritual submissiveness, Christ has told us we can neither see nor enter his kingdom. If we fail to accept Christ, we must, in his own words, eventually face that dreadful moment when we must suffer for our own sins. I pray earnestly that we will not hesitate or equivocate concerning our acceptance of Christ, as some did, even during Jesus' ministry. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. For some, therefore, it is easier to bend the knee in superficial devotion than to bend the mind constantly toward Christ. Now may I give to you my personal answer to the key question, what I think of Christ, indeed what I know of Christ. I testify that he is the divine savior and redeemer of all mankind. He who did not need to die for himself was willing to die for us, to be bound by the chains of death so he could exercise the power of God his father which was inherent in him and thereby break those chains for all mankind. I testify that through Jesus' atonement, he is thereby our mediator and advocate with the flawless Father. Whether descriptively designated as creator, only begotten son, prince of peace, advocate, mediator, son of God, savior, messiah, author, and finisher of salvation, or king of kings, I witness that Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven whereby one can be saved. I testify that he is utterly incomparable in what he is, what he knows, what he has accomplished, and what he has experienced. Yet, movingly, he calls us his friends. We can trust 
worship and even adore him without any reservation as the only perfect person to sojourn on this planet there is as isaiah declared none like him in intelligence and performance christ far surpasses the individual and the composite capacities and achievements of all who have lived live now and will yet live he rejoices in our genuine goodness and achievement yet any assessment of where we stand in relation to him tells us that we do not stand at all we kneel humbly and gladly so we return to the central question what think you of christ perhaps some of you may have participated in public prayer but seldom if ever in private prayer i urge you now to find precious moments alone to kneel down and to ask God the Father concerning the truth of what you have now heard about his Son, our divine Redeemer. Even if you perhaps feel your faith is frail, do as did one courageous person who was not even sure there was a God. He both asked and promised in these halting but fervent words, O oh God, if there is a God, and if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me, and I will give away all my sins to know thee. Desire to know for yourself, and let this desire work in you. Read, study, and apply Jesus' words. He has promised, if any man will do this, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God. It is not by accident that representatives of the Savior have sought you out from among the world. For his sheep know his voice and the voice of his servants, as he himself has declared, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. It is his voice which now calls you into his formal fold, into his church. He has work for you to do, it will be the greatest adventure you will ever know. Accept him, my beloved friends. Believe on his words. The hymn, O Divine Redeemer, contains pleadings which are my pleadings, and those of any who sincerely and reverently approach the Redeemer of the world. Ah, turn me not away. Receive me, though unworthy, Hear thou my cry. Behold, Lord, my distress. Thy pity show in my deep anguish. Shield me in danger. O oh, regard me, O oh, divine Redeemer. Grant me pardon, and remember not, remember not, O oh Lord, my sins. Help me, O oh, divine Redeemer. My friends, I gladly and humbly testify as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ that our divine Redeemer lives with all that those precious and true words imply. And I do so in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Question is an answer. Granted, there have been and still are so many mortals on this planet who do not even yet know the name of Jesus Christ, let alone accept him as their redeemer. Many others are too preoccupied with the cares of the world. Still others acknowledge Jesus as a great moral teacher, as if he were merely a one-time Socrates of Samaria or a Plato who lived in Palestine. Ancient prophets not only foresaw the coming of Jesus in his mortal ministry among the people because of him, and every man went unto his own house. Yet these holy scriptures tell us again and again that he who is known as Jesus of Nazareth is so much more than a man, even a man of genuine historical significance. In fact, Jesus is our resurrected Redeemer, our Lord and Savior. Therefore, what one thinks of Christ represents a determination of deep significance, 
which will affect not only the My friends and neighbors, brothers and sisters all, the most important question in human history is one which will not go away. It echoes down through the corridors of time. And Jesus asked them, what think ye of Christ? Sooner or later, this is the vital question for all mortals, including you, my friends. And a failure to answer this question but also the reaction to Jesus. And alas, most would merely consider him a man. The Apostle John highlighted the differing opinions in that time concerning Jesus. Many of the people said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David? and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was. So there was a division.